This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 172. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's up, SE Nation? Welcome back to another episode. I am your host, Ramsey Majaba. This is not a solo show. It is an interview. And the gentleman I'm interviewing today, we've been talking about getting together on the podcast for close to a year now. He goes by the name of Kerry Skolsky. I think that's what his parents named him. Um, so Kerry, Kerry uh, owns his own business. He does, um, I don't want to kind of, in summary, he does demo reviews. I think he does a lot more, but that's, I guess, what I know him for. And that's what we discuss. Um, check out his website, presalesmastery.com. There will be a link in the show notes for your benefit as well. And we, we did talk, we talk a lot about demos and in general, and because Kerry watches demos all day, every day, that's the topic I wanted to talk to him about. He has, if you go on his website, he, he discusses what he does actually. And I'm bringing it up right now. Presalesmastery.com. He, he has like nine, oh, he'll talk about it on the podcast, but he looks at a lot of different aspects of the demo from performance to what what the content is and engagement with the end user and the customers. So we, we talked about a lot of things about what he looks at, what he looks for, and how we can improve. And it was just a joy to talk to him. Kerry is very open, very honest about everything that he does. So it was great. It was easy. And, you know, with that, let's just jump into the show and see what we discuss. What's up, Kerry? How you doing? I'm great, Ramsey. How you doing? Should we repeat the 10 minutes of conversations we just had before we start recording, or should we just move on? I, I, I think at the, uh, at the risk of alienating the entire audience before we start, we should probably move on. All right. How about we start with this? Uh, who are you? What do you do? And what are you doing here? Good questions. All right. So Kerry Sokolsky, I am the uh, president and founder of Pre-Sales Mastery, a demo performance coaching business. Uh, we work with B2B software companies on helping individuals uh, basically improve their demo execution and performance. And uh, recently became the founder of Sales Engineers of Toronto. We're part of SE Nation. So it's uh-huh. like, uh, helped build the SE community in Toronto where you and I are both located. Yeah. Well, I'm in Ottawa. But are you in Ottawa? Yeah, I'm in Ottawa. I'm, that's a typical Toronto comment. Like everything in Ontario is Toronto. Well, you know, it's it's uh, it's not Ontario anymore. It's just Ottawa. It's just Toronto. Of course, I apologize. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Four hours away. It's not that. It's not that far. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be there in a week and a half. I'm going uh, whitewater rafting. All right. Oh, okay. Are you gonna be in Ottawa or around Ottawa? I'll, I'll give I'm you my the Ottawa River. Okay. Call. I'll give you my phone number. You can call me afterwards. All right. Awesome. You can have this chit chat off off air. I'll buy you a drink, make it up for it, make it up to you. <laughs> so congratulations on SE Toronto. And I'm glad you get to work with uh, Akshat and, uh, and, and, uh, and Eric. I'm sorry you're going to have to work with Owen. Uh, that seems like a... <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's a great crew. I'm uh, Tony Maddows, who used to run pre-sales for Citrus Canada's uh, partnering yeah. with me. So it's a, it's a great crew. We're really supportive. That's great. And uh, they're, they're all, they've all been on the podcast before you, by the way. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm late to the party. What can I tell you? I'm a slacker. Yeah, we started talking like a year ago about being on the podcast, and a year later, you're here. Yay. I know. Better late than never, right? <laughs> Something you just said, you help uh, software companies. Why just software? Well, I, it's, it's mostly just software because software is really where, if you think about it, the, the demo is of critical import in most cases, and whether you win or lose the deal. Right. And we could certainly have a great discussion around all the different types of tasks and responsibilities that pre-sales have that are critical to closing deals, discovery, you know, preparation, the demos, you know, you know, client relationships and side of the meetings. All of those are super important. But when it comes to software, I, I, I you rarely see a vendor win a deal if they haven't done a really good job at the portion of what, when it comes to showing your product, whether it's demos, proof of concepts, workshops, whatever it is. And so uh, I focus on helping sort of really streamline the delivery of showing product, right? Whether it's a demo or a POC. Um, and because of that's where I focus with the software companies. Uh, and 
if you were to say like the biggest mistake you see or the one you see most often that has the highest negative impact on a demo, do you, can you think of one or is there? That's a, yeah, that's a good question. I, there's a lot, right? I, I think fundamentally there are a few, but it, one that's really interesting and, and a lot of people talk about this, a lot of the, the top traders in the space talk about this, but it, it's really putting the focus on the customer. So I talk a lot about first person language and there's there's just this tendency by a lot of SEs to say the word I and me. I really want to show you this. I, I think this is a really cool feature. Um, I love that the, the solution does this. The audience does not care what you think, right? But more importantly, the demo is not about you. And if you're using that language, you're making it about you, where your focus really needs to be on what's best for the prospect and what, what challenges are you helping them solve or help facilitate them? Yeah, I, I've, I've witnessed demos where someone says, oh, I have this very cool feature that I want to show you. And they go and talk for 15 minutes. And then I look at the people wa watching the demo. Their faces hasn't, haven't changed. They didn't get excited or whatever. So yeah, it was a really cool feature for the person doing the demo. I've also heard people like, I have a really cool feature that I think would be beneficial to you. And that seemed to have a different impact. I still don't, I try not to use it, but I like, I guess there are caveats in the way you say it, your body language and all that. But yeah, I, I like that first person language. What kind of language do you use? Third person or? Well, I, it, they, hopefully not third person. Uh, <laughs> Ramsey <laughs> Mejia was going to do that. Oracle no. software that I'm demonstrating to you today. <laughs> um, no, I, I like using second person language, okay. right? Uh, you told us that, you know, the, the struggle around automating these types of workflows and it's causing X, Y, and Z problem, you know, let's look at a, a way that we can help you solve that that's going to do X, Y, and Z for you, right? So it's, it's really reinforcing that second person language, using you, you know, and, and, and that focus where they can envision them, the prospect can envision themselves in the solution or how it's going to work for them. Yeah, and uh, like you've spent a lot of time perfecting or like you're very analytical in the way you do your, uh, I guess your review. You spend a lot of time from what I hear by you. I, I do, yeah. I, I, I spend almost a full day reviewing any given demo. Um, I'll typically review it about three different times. So I'll, I'll watch it in total first, just once through, just to get the full context of what's happening. Um, and then I'll go back and actually go through it and pause the video and start making notes. And then I'll go in and actually do the third time. But in addition to providing feedback inside of the recorded video, and that's what I, that's what I work with is, is I'm coaching on demos that have been delivered to live prospects, um, is I have a 95 metric demo performance scorecard that covers sort of 13 main categories from audience engagement to question handling to technical delivery, verbal delivery, the opening, the close. And it's really a good sort of ob objective, or at least as objective as a human can be, way to really granularly evaluate how someone's doing across all the sort of best practices that you're hoping they're going to bring to the table in any given demo. Um, and, it, you know, you can argue, oh, it's a scorecard, uh, you know, uh, this is good. there's going to be a human element and subjectivity into it. And that's why in order to avoid arguments with SEs that I'm an eight, not a seven, I use a, a very simplified two point scale for every one of those metrics. People either get a zero because they're not doing that particular uh, best practice, a one is they're doing it some of the time or so and so, or a two is they're doing it all the time really well. I really want to remove sort of the um, the human element out of that score so we can get a really objective view of, of where someone's excelling and where they need some improvement. Okay, 95 metrics, 14 areas, a full day of watching video basically. And like a lot of companies think, oh, I have my manager, like VP of sales would say, oh, well, the manager's job is to go do that. But if the manager's spending a full day watching video, they're gonna say like, what are you doing with, what are you doing with your time? Which is, I guess, where you come in. Uh, but it, they... it is, and it's, and it's a common question, right? Like I, I get asked that by, when I'm talking to sort of global pre-sales leaders, the first question they ask is, should my team leaders be doing this? And the first response is exactly what you said, which is, A, do they even have the time to do it? 
if they do have the time for coaching, and to be fair, they should all be doing coaching, right? Coaching, there's lots of studies that show that coaching is the single best way to improve sales outcomes, right? In terms of win rates and, and sort of attainment to, to target. Um, so coaching is absolutely something that everybody should be doing, but I would argue that most first line managers are better off coaching on specific opportunities and the strategy for that opportunity and progressing it rather than spending the time dealing with the tactical execution of delivering great demos. And that's where they can sort of offload to me. The other challenge is how many managers have been formally trained in how to be effective coaches, right? And how many of them are able to bring a really broad perspective to the table and, and, and uh, give a good breadth of, of sort of coaching feedback. Well, that's what I want. I was going to push back at you. It's like, I don't think the managers are really the people that should be coaching either for a multitude of reasons. But basically, I was talking to an SE yesterday and he said he didn't like to talk to his manager because he didn't want to seem stupid. Right. And that's just one. There's a million reasons why they shouldn't. Yeah. But that's just one. Right. And yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting one. It's, uh, I mean, it's kind of a funny, not a funny point. It's an interesting point. I, I was watching actually um, a, a webinar today, but that sort of references, but it's some of the feedback that I give when I talk about um, using, not using jargon, right? And the challenge with jargon, for example, is that most people are afraid to admit ignorance, right? So similar to your point, but I don't want to talk to my manager because I'm afraid I'm not doing the right thing or I'm going to say something silly. So your prospects don't want to admit, oh, what do you mean by, you know, CAP or whatever acronym you happen to be using at the time. And so what they're going to do is just sit there and not know what you're talking about, yeah. right? So it's a really interesting point you bring up. And, you know, part of the reason why a lot of clients engage with me is not even necessarily that they're looking for an outside expert to do this, but they'll actually have um, a, a situation where some of their team just won't even listen to them. So it's almost the opposite pro problem where... Yeah. Managers want to coach, but their team is not responsive to that feedback. And by hiring sort of this objective third-party expert, they tend to be a lot more receptive to that feedback, at least through, through my experience. Uh, yeah, uh, it depends on the individual. And then I like I worked with Absolutely. I worked with one SE who's been on the job for like six months, and by the end of like two sessions, like yeah, I'm good, I'm done. And done what? It's like oh, I learned everything I need to know. It's like all right, good luck. I'll see you in six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a dangerous attitude, right? I mean, it, it, you know, I, 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 I've coached lots of people that have been doing this for 10 or 15 years. And the, the analogy I give them, because a lot of them tend to be somewhat skeptical when they hear they're going through this coaching program. So oh, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm doing great, hitting my numbers all the time. And the analogy I use is, look, you know, even the best athletes in the world use coaches, right? Like Michael Jordan had Tim Rover's conditioning and shooting coach yep. his entire career. And he recognized that, you know, that one or 2% improvement could make the difference between hitting that game winning shot and not. And similar for us as he's, you know, you know, getting rid of one or two bad habits or learning one or two new tricks could be the difference between winning one more deal every year. And what does that mean to your commission check at the end of the month? 100%. Did you read Tim's book? Uh, I didn't. I need to, that's on my list. Okay. Well, if you want uh, this for the general population who are listening, he was on a recent episode of a bigger pockets podcast. And if you're not familiar with bigger pockets, they're about real estate, but they also talk about leadership and mentality and all that. So you might want to check it out. He, he, it was oh. one of the better, better ones there. I'll send you a link later. I'll even put it on the show notes. For sure. Uh, all right. So have you, has anyone ever recruited you and sent you a demo and you watched it and the perfect demo, has that ever happened or as close to perfect as it can be? I've, I've seen some really good demos. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I look, it, no one's ever perfect. So I'm certainly not perfect, right? Um, it's funny, you know, Chris White and I uh, work on a couple of projects together. And Chris asked me to, to coach one of his demos recently, right? Yeah. And, you know, even, even the best of us can always use a, a different perspective, right? And I think that's what it sort of comes down to is even if the demo is great, there, there may be one or two other things that could be added that might even make it better, right? And, and that's really what it comes down to is for, for people that have been doing this for a long time is, could you be even better than you are, right? Um, and most people could be, even if it's, even if it's marginal. And, and you know what the great thing about that with, with Chris is, is he asked me to do the same. Nice. So th there's this guy who, who is a trainer who's been doing this for 20 years asking, like, I'm, I'm a rookie compared to him. And you've been doing this for a while, like, and he's still asking for feedback. 
from people and you know and then you have a guy who's been on the job for six months and saying i'm good i learned everything i needed to learn yeah i think that's a it's a it's a dangerous attitude i it, when i'm when i'm talking to pre-sales leaders about my coaching program i will typically ask them to sort of plot their team on a two-point axis on one axis sort of their overall perceived performance of that individual on the other axis their their receptiveness to feedback and at the end of the day if they're completely non-receptive to feedback they're not a good candidate for the coaching, right? Yeah. Because it's a waste of money, right? Um, I could give them amazing ideas and amazing advice. And if they're not open to it and I'm wasting their time and I'm wasting the company's money. Yeah. And uh, one thing you just said that I, what did I want to say? I, uh, you were talking about as he's hitting their quota. I, I don't need whatever. I hit my quota for the first two years and I didn't know what discovery was. So hitting your quota doesn't mean you're a good SE. It just might mean that you have a very good salesperson or the customers just want to buy from you. I, I'm you really glad it? you brought that up. I think that's a really, really relevant point. I think too often today, what, what the perception of good performance is based on either some sort of you know, performance type metric around you know, attainment to quota or total revenue generated or number of deals closed or some even more artificial activity number, like number of demos or you yeah. know, progression rates and how many gone to POC or stuff like that, which ultimately, yeah, there's, there's some sort of influence on whether they're doing decently or not, but that's really not a good measure of whether they're a good or a bad SE. Yeah, well, there isn't one measure that can tell that. Like it has, you have to take, like even number of demos that you did. I, I'm coaching people to do like count, count or measure how many demos you refuse to do because yes. they're being actually told to do demos that are unqualified. So measure how many you're, how many unqualified demos you're telling them no, right? And sometimes you have to do unqualified demos because politics, whatever, but yeah. Okay, 14 areas where you look at uh, the demo. Do you mind sharing what are some of those 14 areas? Like what are the most important things that we should look at when we're doing a demo? Yeah, I do a lot around sort of audience engagement and audience management. Right. Um, and so that's obviously over the last year and a half with COVID and almost all demos going remote, yeah. it's become even more important. Um, really keeping the audience engaged and making sure that your demos are a dialogue. Uh, you know, I, I, I think I saw actually on your last podcast when you were uh, going on your rant about, you know, skills that you shouldn't be worried about. Uh, you know, I, I, there was a comment about sort of, you know, asking questions is more important than answering them. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that's absolutely the truth, right? I think that if it's a if it's a monologue, then you're doing the wrong thing, uh, and you're going to lose people. And so I talk a lot about sort of tips and tricks on how to actually keep the audience engaged in a remote call, right? Like one of the things that's almost counterintuitive to a lot of the advice that people get right now is around the use of your webcam. And I'm actually sort of a, a, a bit of a contra um, sort of. A, 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 um, a, indicator on this one where I actually believe that when you're showing something on your uh, presentation, whether it's a presentation deck or your yeah. demo of the software, you should be turning your webcam off, right? Yeah. Because people are have a natural tendency to migrate their attention towards movement. And invariably, we all move around when we're talking. You can see my head's moving around, my hands are moving around, I'm animated, right? And you know, I might not do as much of that during a demo, but I probably do. And people are gonna be more focused on you than your demo if they're seeing your face. Right now, when you're not showing the product, right? Or you're not you know, you know, working through a slide, absolutely turn your camera on and engage because it's gonna A, encourage them to do it and they can see you and it's much more better to connect. But I, I sort of, I, I, I seem to be in a bit of a, in a minority these days around sort of turning the camera off at times. Well, if, it, if it's any consolation, Peter Cohen said the exact same thing to me like over a year and a half ago. Nice. Right, so you're you're in good company when when it comes to that, and we did like virtual training at my at my work, which by the way the SEs were not invited to, and I kind of gave them crap about that. Uh, so I'm a hybrid. I was invited to it because technically my title is sales manager, but I right. actually do sales engineering work. They invited me to it, and I'm like, the SEs are going to be doing most of the demos, most of the whiteboarding, most of the workshops. Why are you inviting the salespeople to this session? Uh, yeah, so. There's a problem with not giving training to SEs uh, about that topic, but a big focus was uh, how do you get the customer to turn on the camera? And in my mind, it's like, why is that the most important thing? Like, 
Yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's, look, there's lots of nonverbal cues that you can get from people, but you also can, can miss stuff on, on, a, on a camera as well, right? I think if people really don't want to be seen or they're doing other stuff and it's, and it's egregious, they're going to turn off the camera regardless, right? Yeah. Um, but I think you can ask people, right? Like you can say to them, would you mind turning on your camera? I'd love to sort of have a face-to-face. Well, right? what I do is I turn on the camera and say, hey, I just wanted to scare you for a couple of minutes. And it's the same joke every single time. And I've been called out that I've done the same joke for the same customer on a couple of different occasions. But hey, then it's a joke about how I use the same joke. So it, it works out. But that yeah. saying that actually, for some reason, helps customers turn it on. And I don't ask them like, hey, you don't want to turn it on. It's fine. I, I don't want you to be uncomfortable. Well, I want you to be as comfortable as you can be. If it's if that means the camera is off, yeah. keep it off. If it's on, turn it on. And on, like you can't really get a lot of verbal, uh, uh, not verbal, uh, nonverbal cues from a webcam. It's hard. But if you, if you listen intently, if you crack jokes, if you try to build that relationship and you know have a warm environment, you'd feel a big difference. But okay. Yeah. No. I. Um, I mean, one of the one of the tips that I like to talk about is I'm a big, big proponent of using people's names throughout the demo, right? And so I'm very, very cognizant of making sure I'm taking copious notes for my SE the coach or taking copious notes about who's in the meeting and who they are so that they can refer to them directly later, whether it's referencing something back that they said earlier, right? Where then you get credibility with them, um, but you also build the relationship with them by saying their name. But the other thing you do is you, you bring them to attention. When you call someone out by name, Right? If they're not paying attention, you better believe that single word, it, it's actually, there's a study that's been done that actually shows that your brain activates more when your name is, is called, right? And so it actually will bring people attention. The other thing it'll do is it'll scare everybody else in the room because if you're going to call one person out, they might be the next ones to be called out, right? So just using someone they can actually have a pretty powerful impact. Um, if you don't believe, Carrie, this is, this is a true story. If I'm asleep, and that has nothing to do with sales engineering, but if I'm asleep, I'm out. They, like, I actually slept through a bomb in Lebanon. Like A bomb blew up 200 meters away from my house. I did not wake up. But if someone says my name or whispers it, I'm up. Right? There you go. That, yeah, so that's proof, I guess, <laughs> anecdotal. But I, Names are more, more powerful than bombs. I'm going to use that, that now. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I, I grew up, yeah, it's it's a sad thing to say, but yeah, that happened. Um, Glad you're okay. Oh, I, I I had no idea what happened, honestly. My mom woke me up the next day and she said, uh, Ramsey, in case anybody asks at university, yes, a bomb did go off 200 meters away from us. Like, wow. I, yeah, uh, that was back in 2005 when things were happening in Lebanon. When, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, so there's... <laughs> The, calling them by name, turn on the camera. How do you get how? That's the easy part, or I guess whatever. How do you get them to actually care to answer versus being quiet on the other end and sleepy? Well, I I, I think one of the, one thing that I'm I I see a lot of SEs and frankly account execs do as well really really poorly is they fail at the introductions portion of their meetings because. And, and try and see this when you're in your next meetings with other people, how they do introductions. When you get into the meeting, the majority of, of demos that I see, the account execs normally the one doing the intros. And what they'll say is, okay, let's go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves. And what does the introduction entail? It's what's your name and what's your rule? And that's it. And while those are important to know, what's 10 times more important is why they're in the room in the first place. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely hammered into my SEs to say, look, if your account exec is not doing this, then interject and say, oh, as well, if you don't mind, can you give us the top one or two reasons that you're here today or the top one or two things you're looking to get out of the meeting? Okay. And then make sure you're, you're, you're cross-referencing that with who said it. And that way you can then reference when you cover those things in your demo later, you can re-reference back to them. And that's a really powerful thing. I love that. I've, I've always thought about doing it, but I've actually never done it. And so there you, go. you just said you, it. You yeah, no, like, that's what I love about the podcast. There's always something like, I've been doing this for 
Well, you're you're episode 172, and I'm still learning stuff. That's that's great. Um, and the one thing I wanted to note now, virtually, it's so much easier to actually find out the people's names because they're on yeah. on there, and you can tell who's talking because their name is lighting up generally. Sure. Unless there are multiple people in the same room, which is happening more frequently now. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's true. That's even hard. Oh, yeah, you're, that's true. All right. So, audience engagement and audience measurement. How do you measure audience? Like, what, what is that? Sorry, it was, it was audience management. And engagement. Man, oh, that I, I miss. Uh, same, same, same topic, really, right? So, yeah. um, so this di- it's the same thing we just talked about, right? Dialogue, the fact that you're pausing all the time to actually give them a chance to speak, right? What, what, what so many of us SEs do is we get super excited about our technology, right? We're excited about our product, our solution, how we can fix the, the prospect's problems. And we just we just wanna talk, right? And we're excited to get to the next point or whatever it is or address the next challenge or how we're gonna add value. And if you just sort of pause at the end of each sort of thing you're doing, it gives the audience a chance to interject, right? And audiences tend to not want to sort of interrupt people. That's another sort of demo sin I coach against. They don't ever interrupt the prospect. But similarly, the audience doesn't necessarily want to interrupt the speaker right a lot of the times. And so if you don't pause to give them an opportunity to interject, then they won't. No. One thing I want to add to that is tell your account manager that when you pause, they shouldn't be the ones interjecting. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Good yeah I've, I've seen that where you're pausing, even though there's a bit of tension you're hoping someone would like break the ice and someone from the other side would say, it's usually the account manager who can't wait. It's like, oh, it's too much silence. Yeah, yeah they, they, account execs tend to be uncomfortable with silence. And a little bit of silence can be really good. You don't want it too much, but a little bit can usually be really good. But that's the strange part. Account managers should be using that as part of negotiation, right? Like they should use silence. There should be tension. Yeah, good point. So, yeah. When they're not in control, kind of when they don't know what's happening, and that's happened the other way around. Like when account managers are negotiating for some reason, somebody else is in the room, they should tell them like, shut up while there's silence. Okay, so we talked about the one out of 14 areas. Uh, there's 20 minutes left of this podcast. Let's go through <laughs> the other 13. Uh, what are the top ones? Like what, what, are you, like what are the most important ones that you wanna share? So a couple ones are sort of uh, question and objection handling is a big one. It's got about 10 different things in it. Um, so the biggest one for me there is too many SEs, and SEs tend to be very smart people, right? But there's a problem with being the smartest person in the room is that you can make assumptions that you understand stuff you don't, yeah. right? And a, a, big, a, a big challenge I see, unfortunately, is when someone gets, when an SE gets asked a question, they assume they understand they're under, they, they assume their understanding of what's actually being asked when in reality they don't. Yeah. And so one of the items on my scorecard is that either you're paraphrasing the question back to the person that posed it, right, in your own words to make sure that you've interpreted it correctly, or you're asking a follow-up question or two to clarify your understanding of it, right? I, you know, you said this, do you mean this or do you mean that? Or I think what you're saying is you'd like to understand X, Y, and Z, is that correct? Yeah. And then answer, because the worst thing you can do is not only answer the wrong question, but answer it for a long time, right? Like, because people don't like to do short answers. Like they like to be verbose and, and effusive. And instead of just saying yes or no, or whatever it is, they go off these tangents. And for two minutes, the audience is like, what the heck is he talking about? Or is she talking about? Yeah. So. And this is especially true, like it gets even harder like in places like Canada. I, I think the US is the same and maybe Europe where there are so many different cultures and people with different accents and different understandings of the English language. Like even in Canada, we have French Quebecers who are trying to explain stuff in English to French Quebecers because there's an English account manager in the room, right? And thing, so we, we kind of have to figure out how to Make sure we understand it correctly and you know there's a limitation of language uh, there's a language barrier sometimes even if yeah. we're all in the same place it's uh i mean it's funny the 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 best example is i, I early on in my pre-sales career probably in the second or third year we were pitching general electric and 
I was told by one of the directors there to say, basically said, assume that, you know, the GE people you're going to be pitching are the smartest people you've ever pitched to, and don't ever assume you have any clue what they're talking about. So make sure you clarify it before you answer anything. And it, that sort of was, was great advice early in my career. Is that, is that a common thing? Like I've seen it, but is it very common that SEs forget to clarify what the customer is actually asking? Yeah, it's, it, it's pre, it is pretty common. Now, the, the reason that it doesn't tend to be a deal breaker too often is because a lot of the time they're right. They've interpreted it correctly in that assumption, right? right? But the, you know, the five or 10% or however low it is, those times when you do misinterpret and you start answering the wrong question, A, it shows a little bit of arrogance, right? That you're making the assumption that you know what you're talking about. And B, it shows that you're not really paying attention, right? Yeah. So how can we build that habit? Like, so it's, you're telling me about it. Okay, great. And then I go to the next meeting and I do the exact same mistake. How can I overcome that? Yeah, great question. So this is one of the reasons why I, I got into sort of coaching rather than doing training. So there, there are so many great programs out there by, you know, amazing demo pre-sales leaders. And we talked about uh, Chris White earlier. We were talking about Peter Cohen, who is, is a new partner of mine. Um, John Kerr. There's, there's a lot of really great demo trainers out there but like almost any type of sales training it's one-off training right they're going to come in they're going to do their week-long workshop or whatever it is and then they leave and a lot of research has been done that shows that one-time training you lose at least 90 percent of it within a month if yep. it's not regularly practiced and reiterated on and that's not just pre-sales or demo that's any type of sales training uh, which is why sales kickoffs tend to be such a waste because you do this massive brain dump on your team, and then a month later, everyone forgets everything they learned, right? And yeah, you had some great parties together, and you, you know, got to go drink and have great dinners, but at the end of the day, everyone's forgotten what they learned. And yeah. so what my coaching does is I do three-month engagements with my clients where I'm coaching them on demos over a three-month period where I'm reiterating and repeating okay. and, and, and you know, continuing to sort of force those that feedback onto them in a repetitive way where it starts to become part of their sales muscle memory so that they don't forget it. So what happens after those three months? So typically one of two things happens. One is either they were new with me if they feel like they, they need to continue. Um, and in a lot of cases, it, it's a subset of the people that are participating. Um, maybe some of the more seasoned people have gotten what they need out of after three months and some of the more junior SEs will say, we'd like a couple more months worth. Um, or in some cases, uh, what they will do is they'll take my scorecard and the results and they'll actually build uh, their ongoing enablement and sort of structure their one-on-ones with their teams around the results of those scorecards. So at the end of three months, there is say five or six of those metrics that they're still not doing great. That's where they're focused their own internal enablement on uh, when they're working with their team. So you don't fire them after three months, say, huh, I'm done with you. Like, I, 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 new. I've, I've only once fired somebody and it was someone that had gone through the program and was fantastic. They were amazing. And I didn't feel that they were getting their money's worth based on the amount of feedback I was able to give. Okay. Um, right. Cause I, you know, I don't, I don't want to take people's money for nothing. Right. I'd rather that I'm delivering value to them the same way everybody wants to deliver value to all their clients. Right. So. Yeah, that's. Well, yeah, no one wants to, you to take their money. I, I've never seen that. Just please take my money. Um, yeah, nice problem to have, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of objection handling, we had Doug uh, Brown a few weeks ago. He wrote the book about objection handling. And it's not usually something that SEs talk about or SEs are talked about, about that topic. And the main mistake that I see from SEs is getting defensive. How, do you see that as well? And how do you coach them to get out of that? I, I think in, in a lot of cases, it's less getting defensive and more feeling like they have to address that immediate objection rather than the underlying cause of the objection. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that's where they sort of get off the rails a lot of the time. I think if you can unpack the objection and really understand what's driving it, you can answer it much more uh, effectively than just saying, oh, I'm just going to deal with whatever it is. Now, you're always going to get the stump the chump type folks in your demos occasionally where they're just there because either, you know, they're IT folks and they, you know, that's their job is to be confrontational or you've got people where I, I've seen this and this is a very real problem in a lot of 
um, line of when you're selling a line of business is that sometimes the solution you're selling is either going to eliminate someone's job or a good portion of their responsibilities. Yeah. And that can be extremely threatening. So if you don't handle your messaging really carefully in those situations, you know, the line of business users can get very sort of confrontational too, right? And so you, that, that to me is more about being proactive about the fact that, look, we're not eliminating your job and being careful about how you're messaging that rather than we're sort of unlocking your time to do more value added activities. Yeah, we had we had uh, a meeting once, and one of the benefits was, oh, you won't have to, you won't need these people anymore. And one of the leaders of that those people was in that room. Yeah, uh, I don't think we got the the, the deal. And so I, yeah, it's that's that's a tough one. Yeah, yeah spoiler <laughs> alert: making people obsolete is not usually what they want to hear. Yeah, I, I try to phrase it in a way like, I, well, I try to figure out like, if you're not doing this, what else are you doing? What could you be using your time for? Oh, I could be using my time for that. And okay, if you do that, how will that help a company? All right, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. Now we just freed up 15 hours of your time. Go go do that. Absolutely. So can you share one more? What What's one more aspect that you're looking at? I think we're going to do like another 10 episodes to cover all 14 areas, but... I like it, I like it. Um, <laughs> so another big one is around messaging and content. And so while when I start with a new client, I'm never an expert in their space invariably, I end up watching a lot of their demos across a lot of their people. And so I end up seeing more of their product than usually they do right? yep. in a very short order. So by like the, the third or fourth one, I start to give really pointed feedback around sort of types of messaging and improving the content and stuff like that. But one that's, that's really interesting to me is, is, is that a lot of SEs still feel compelled to show what I call throwaway content, right? Which is in my opinion, anything that is table stakes, so any vendor in the space can do it, or that really doesn't have any obvious benefits or relevance to that particular prospect's challenges, right? So for example, uh, you know, integrations with a certain tool might be important. Showing the interface about how you set up that integration probably is not going to win or lose you the deal, and it's probably just gonna waste a minute or 90 seconds that you could be spending on something much more important. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I, I find too often SEs, even if they're really focusing on value messaging and all this other stuff, still tend to have a lot of this sort of, what I, this sort of this throwaway content, these real sort of you know, non-value added or table stakes type of stuff that isn't moving the dial at all. Nice. Have you, so one thing that I, I talk, I've talked to uh, new SEs about when they're new to a company or whatever, the, their confidence level in the product is not great, mainly because they have a lot to show and they don't know, they don't know or understand all. How, you tr how do you talk about like tackling that? Do you tell them like, just keep repeating the demo over and over or focus on one aspect? What is the solution that you have in your mind that's worked for most? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I, I think that's just part of an overall enablement and onboarding process where I, when I was running pre-sales teams, I was a massive component on cross team learning, right? Where we would have you know, our weekly uh, team meetings and I think every other team meeting, we would spend half of the meeting where one SE on the team would demo to the rest of the team. And then everyone would provide feedback, good and bad, right? And that way they're getting a huge swath of different perspectives on how to improve or what to do. Um, and more importantly is everybody got exposed to everybody else's different styles and methodologies and messaging and all that kind of stuff. Because even if you're doing an amazing job and you're killing it, chances are there are other people on your team that have different perspectives about how to pitch that particular feature or you know, a different, you know, different click path to get through this particular value mess message or part, or, or part of the tool that could be better than what you're doing, right? And it's getting exposure to that, and I think is really key. So. I, I'm, I'm really big on making sure that there's cross team sharing. And so when I'm doing my coaching, one of the things I do for some of my clients, I don't do it for all of them, but some of my clients, there's a, a feature in the online coaching platform that allows me to sort of take snippets of the demos that I can then share with the rest of the team. And so we almost make like a best practices library in some cases uh, to share across the team. And that's one way to do it. But watching your, your colleagues demo live or watching recordings of what they've delivered um, to me is, is the biggest way to do it. It's not just watching yourself and getting feedback on your own stuff. It's watching what everybody else is doing. 
Yeah, I, I learn a lot just by watching product managers talk about the product. I don't, I don't learn a lot about how they demo the product because usually their demo is really horrible. But the reason why we came up with something over another, right? Because uh, sometimes people ask about that. In, in my industry, we're selling to people like engineers who wrote the standards or like they're very much into the bits and bytes. And yeah. sometimes the reason we came up with it, this solution versus that solution makes a big difference in their eyes. So I guess it's, it's very, uh, I guess, industry dependent. Yeah. But like, yeah, yeah right. find someone who demos it and watch it, I guess. That's the, that's the biggest tip. And yeah, and, and nobody... but to your point, I just did one of my own demo sets, right? Like I didn't really clarify what you meant by that question, which was, it sounds like more related to the product and comfort with the product rather than demoing the product. Right. Well, and, and I should have the same, right? But you know, well, you, answered, you answered it. Uh, yeah. But, but to your point, like you went to a product manager and wanted to see how they sort of how they, why, how and why they built those features into the product. Whereas I was more answering sort of how to necessarily demo those features or in the product. And those are two slight nuanced, but slightly yeah. different things, right? Well, uh, yeah, I guess they're nuanced. You can, you can use it as, for, for me in my mind, when you're doing a demo, you get asked a lot of like, why did you go this way, not that way? So that's, it's a personal thing for me. You answered the question properly, 100%. Okay. All right. My, my brain, because I'm also thinking like, what if you're the first SE to a company? You can't watch your colleagues, but you can talk to the CEO or whoever hired you that they could do the demo. So that's that's where my brain was going, and I couldn't I couldn't process all that at the same time. Multitasking is a myth. I've I've been the first SE at a company before, and uh, yeah, watched watched one of the co-founders demo. But a lot of it is just getting over the fear of not needing to know everything. Right, I, I think that's you know, I, me personally at least, I I learn much quicker when I'm thrown feet first into the fire, right? And I think it's it's sort of you have to experience a lot of these types of questions or objections or situations um, before you're really going to truly be comfortable dealing with them, rather than just learning them in a classroom or learning from a manager or whatever. You really sort of have to experience them to have that true comfort level. Yeah, and what I've noticed, the more you know and the more you show, the more questions come up that you don't know, anyways. So. Maybe you shouldn't go into it. The best demo I did was a mistake where they said they wanted one thing or sorry, my account manager did the discovery and he told me the customer wanted one thing. And then when it showed up to the demo, they said, oh, we know we want something else like the, the underlying infrastructure, which I was supposed to show. I skipped all that and just said, here it is. Any and questions? You do, right? You need to pivot. Yeah. Right? And I walked I walked out of there with the product with the VP of product management. He said, "That's the best demo I've ever seen," and I'm like sweating. I'm like so angry at myself because I didn't uh, didn't qualify the account manager properly. But hey, it worked but, out. But you you made it about the prospect, right? They told I you. I had to at that point. Well, that's okay. It's not intentional whatsoever, but it worked out. <laughs> uh, all right, it's time to move on to the not so fire round. Although okay. there's like 13, uh, 11 areas left. We'll leave them for later. Spoiler, uh, it's a, we'll leave it as a teaser. And, you know, people can reach out to you and get that information, you know, hire you. They will get that information. For Absolutely, you. yeah. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Go to presalesmastery.com. Happy to talk to anybody. Yeah. Or ask me about, about Kerry. I'll let you know. So here's, the, this is the not so fire round. These are the same four questions we ask almost every guest. Okay. Uh, what do you love about what you do today in terms of coaching? So I... I I've run sort of pre-sales teams. I've been an individual contributor in pre-sales. I've run sales enablement teams. Uh, my, my biggest thing when I was um, a pre-sales leader was working with amazing people. Um, what I love about coaching is that I get exposed to so many awesome people. I, I get to work with tons of organizations and tons of great people. Um, I have occupational ADD in, in this sort of way, so to speak. And so being able to work with lots of different clients and tons of different SEs to me is sort of the way to get around that. And so uh, that's what I like about my business is uh, just I, I get to, to work with cool people uh, almost on, on a daily basis, which is really cool. Great. And you, so you've been doing this for a while. You've been, you've been exposed to a lot of companies, a lot of SEs and a lot of t SE teams. Is, if, if there's one thing you would change about the role of sales engineering or the way they're treated or whichever way you want to take it, what would that be? I think I would um, I, I would say to people that pre-sales and sales engineering has a 
common word in it, and that is sales. And that ultimately, at the end of the day, in almost every case, it should be a sales role. Yes, we don't want to be the prototypical obnoxious salesperson. We're there to be the trusted advisor and all that kind of stuff and the, and the bridge between you know, technology and, and the client needs and that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you're going to be much more effective if you're, in, if, you're, if you're having a sales mindset that the goal at the end of the day is to you know, get more customers right, and win those deals. Right. And so what what I'm what I, I really see as a problem in the in the industry today, and I am sort of biased on this because I spent a decade at a Toronto based uh, software company called Verisync that got bought by IBM and it was at IBM for a bunch of years and Verisync is now a private company again, but we were in the incentive comp management space. So I'm very intimately familiar with compensation plans. And you know, if you look at the consensus survey they just did a, a little while ago on, on compensation and workload and pre-sales, less than, I think, 31% of SEs hold an individual quota. Yeah. quota. And I, I hear, I speak to a lot of pre-sales leaders about why that's the case. And it doesn't work for every role in every organization, right? I'm, I, I'm not going to say it's a, a panacea that everyone should be in an individual quota, but a lot of the common objections for why people want people to be either on bonus plans or on team-based commission plans, there's such easy, not easy, but there are such workable ways around those objections. And I don't think enough people are doing it. And I think one thing that I've seen make the biggest change in impact on performance across an entire team is switching from team-based comp to individual comp. Because what you really do is you sort of separate the wheat from the chaff. Right, the people that are happy to just sort of coast are going to end up suffering, right, and and or change their behavior. And the people that are that are normally going to excel are now going to make a lot more money and be incented to excel even more. And so it really sort of tends to lift all boats at the end of the day, um, and everybody but does better be, because of it. And so I, I I would challenge anybody that's that's on a team only plan to really you know understand why are they objecting to an individual plan? And if, they, if they'd like to chat about it more, I'm very happy to talk about comp with them because I've, I've seen probably a thousand, 2000 different comp plans in my career uh, and lots of pre-sales comp plans. So I, I'm very happy to talk about sort of different workarounds and ways to, to deal with that. As soon as you said that, it reminded me that I wrote an article for Vivin about one-to-one -one pairing or an SE pool. And okay. it's, it's based on like commission, like why all that. And I am all for one-to-one -one pairing. You could tell that by the by the by the blog itself. So I'll, I'll add that to the show notes as well. Uh, I'll check that out. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. All right. Next question: Is there a resource you'd recommend for sales engineers to be exposed to, including sales engineers of Toronto? Uh, yeah, and thanks for the plug. Um, you know, there's there's a, there's so much great content now for pre-sales. Um, I mean, we, we, we talk a lot about the, the pre-sales tooling space is exploding with 300 million in, in investment in the last year and a bit. Um, but what's really great is that there is just so much awesome content from all the great thought leaders in the space. Uh, and there are so many of them now. Um, I mean, you look at what uh, Consensus did with DemoFest and the lineup there. I mean, you were a speaker on DemoFest. Um, and, you know, your podcast alone is, is you know, bringing tons of amazing experts to the table. I, I think if you search out there on LinkedIn for pre-sales, uh, you know, follow the thought leaders in the space. There's you know probably 15 to 20 um, that you know you can follow either the individuals or the podcasts that are out there. There's sort of the webinars like this one that are out there. Um, and I would say don't look at one single one source. Look at everybody because everybody's got great stuff out there now. And you are now more active on LinkedIn and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I am. I'm uh, well. Hey, I'm, I'm finally on your show, right? <laughs> right a year later. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, last question of the not so fire round. Um, is there a habit you're working on today that will help you improve? Is there a habit I'm working on today? Wow, great question. Um, yeah, I think uh, the habit for me, and, and this, I think we'll go back to your last episode about multitasking, um, where you wanted an awesome rant about multitasking is not a thing, it's not a skill. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I find myself. Um, working on lots of different simultaneous projects and when you're running your own business uh you, you kind of have to wear a lot of hats yeah. um but I, I think what i'm trying to force myself to do is get to closure on individual tasks a lot quicker uh rather than sort of working everything in parallel at once 
So I think that's something I'm, I'm trying to get better at. That's, that's a good idea. I approve of that habit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> For whatever it's worth. Uh, you, you already mentioned where people can uh, reach out to find you. You also, like, unfortunately, this is going to air the week after your SE Toronto meetup. But if people want to check out the next meetup, where can they do that? Yeah, great question. Uh, follow SE Toronto, our sales engineers of Toronto on LinkedIn. Uh, if you follow our page, all of our announcements for next events are going to be up there. We're going to be running hopefully an in-person event next time. This one's a, a, a remote one, but now that things are starting to open up, at least in Ontario, uh, we're hoping to get everybody in person for the next one. So uh, easier way to sort of network uh, and build, you know, and, and, and really sort of have a good time when we're in person. So uh, September should be our next event, but uh, follow us on LinkedIn and uh, you'll get automatic notification when that comes up. So, okay. So you're having one on uh, July 27th. I said next week. Yeah. Yep. So um, it'll, be la- it'll be last week when this airs, unfortunately. Uh, but then the next one will be in September. So two months after that. Correct. That's good timing. All right, man. Well, it was a pleasure having you on, Kerry. I look forward to our next conversation. You're always welcome here. So, and we'll talk to you later. Ramsey, really appreciate the time. Always a pleasure. And uh, sorry it took me so long to get into uh, do it with you. I I, I kind of take the blame on that as well. We, we won't wait so long for the next one. Yeah, for sure. Take care. Thank you, Carrie, for coming on. And thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you get something out of this and maybe find a way to actually improve your demos. And if you're a manager, we know that management isn't just talking to SEs. There's a lot that goes behind the scenes that SEs may or may not know about. So... If you have time to watch uh, this uh, demo all day, then by all means, go ahead and do that. If not, reach out to Kerry. He didn't sponsor the show or anything. I just, for me personally, I think coaching is an important aspect of sales engineering and there isn't that many resources out there. Uh, There are a handful of resources. So check it out. Go on his website, presalesmastery.com. If you have any questions, you can either reach out to him directly or if you need someone to introduce you, reach out to me. I'll be happy to do so. Yeah. I, I'd love to think, I'd love to know, I cannot speak English today. I'd love to know what you guys thought about the discussion between me and Carrie. So when I put the LinkedIn post, make sure you comment on it. Let me know what you think. Add, add your own comments, add your own thoughts. If you have any questions for Carrie, post them on there. I'm sure he'll, he'll respond or we'll do another session. If there are so many We'll do another Q&A with Carrie and we'll go over those. So yeah, um, I got nothing else to say really other than have a great day. I hope you're, you enjoy this and I will talk to you next time for Ram, for myself, I guess. This is Ramsey signing off.